Hi, and thank you very much for joining us today for Lecture 3 of the course on Testing Complex Intelligent Systems and Autonomous Vehicles. My name is Daria, and I'm a part of the ExactPair research team. If for some reason you missed the previous lectures or you want to get back to them at some point, then they're available in the course playlist on the ExactPair Systems YouTube channel. Please feel free to subscribe. We release new content all the time, so you're almost guaranteed to bump into something interesting every week. Today's lecture is about Application Programming Interfaces, or APIs. ExecPro specializes in tools that test complex financial systems that widely use APIs. With this lecture, we would like to, so to say, feed two birds with one scone. We're going to talk about examples of APIs that will be used in the workshop sessions of the course. At the same time, we would like to share examples from the realm of trading and exchange systems, which may be useful for people interested in starting their work in fintech or maybe even with ExactPro at some point. So, APIs are used in different types of systems that come with different quality requirements, depending on the system specifics. There are systems that can pose a threat to human life and health. Autonomous vehicles, the subject of this course, are one of them. There are systems that can cause financial or reputation, reputational damage, for example, trading platforms. These kinds of systems have been the subject of our research and our focus ever since the company was founded. And then there are websites. It's a kind of system that can technically afford to be non-operational without causing too much damage. As LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman famously said, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, then you've launched too late. A website is a kind of product this quote may refer to because websites can afford the luxury of being tested in production. In today's lecture, I will try to give examples of each of these types of systems. Obviously, API is a broad term, and one lecture can't possibly cover a topic this extensive. That's why you can refer to multiple sources to go deep and wide. For example, this Wikipedia page you see on the slide briefly reviews the history of the term, the types of APIs, and most importantly, whether you can register ownership rights to an open source interface such as Java API and what the Supreme Court thinks about it. We would also like to recommend a video called API for Beginners. You'll learn what APIs do, why they exist, and the many benefits you can reap from them. How APIs are used in programming and web development. You'll also get hands-on experience with several popular web APIs. Here's also a useful playlist consisting of 11 videos dealing with the economic implications of APIs. This series of short videos answers the following questions. What are APIs? How can I benefit from their flexibility? How do APIs affect the company culture? And what is the API economy? They also talk about security, API types, uses, and other topics. This slide will contain um, a link to one video of their series. And this link will lead you to an article with a video about four types of web APIs. This link in its turn will help you learn about the types and examples of APIs. What is an interface? When we deal with any device, there's usually a set of controllers that we use to interact with it, sometimes even without understanding how it works internally. This external wrapper of the device or program that acts as an abstract representation and allows the user to interact with the system is the interface. Interfaces change, their functionalities evolve, so do the ways we interact with them. As technology advances, new features and options appear. And even without going into much detail, we do understand how it all works as far as the realm of our control is concerned. One example of an interface is a GUI, or a graphic user interface. Much of the GUI comes from the world of physical interactions with devices and objects. We click on buttons, we swipe pages, we drag objects, we store files in folders, and so on. Clearly, there's code behind every such button. It's safe to say that the developer who designed this button with all of its visual and maybe audio effects who also managed to link it to a specific action, doesn't necessarily know how exactly the whole system is implemented. He simply wrote the code that triggers interactions between one program, for example, a browser and another, let's say the system's backend or a streaming service. In fact, this code allows the programmer, as opposed to the end user, to interact with other programs, and this interaction itself is carried out via the API, or the Application Programming Interface. So what exactly is an API? 
all software interfaces are a set of ways we can interact with some physical or software objects. For example, change them or message them. On the software side, the API is a kind of agreement, a kind of convention where the rules of use are and the available functionality are specified. For a developer, it's a set of tools which gives access to the data and the abstract implementation of the system. When the term API is mentioned, people often associate it with the web API or the web interface. But in fact, from a video embedded into a website to a calendar widget on your phone, we are surrounded by a lot of different kinds of APIs. Furthermore, programming interfaces exist as part of programming languages. How, you might ask? Well, they exist as a kind of a set of built-in functions. For example, we call a function which can process data in a specific way. We could write detailed code to perform this task, or we can save time and effort and just call the function that will do it for us. These kinds of functions are created when the task we are solving is a trivial task routinely performed by a programmer. Since we're talking about interfaces, different systems can provide their own implementations of these interaction rules to make the code work properly in their environment. A very good example of this is a web browser. In general, a web application is a rather complex, multi-layered structure that easily illustrates the diversity of API types. Consider the simplest version of a static web server. The client or an application in a browser sends HTTP or HTTPS requests to the server. The server responds by sending static content in the form of HTML or CSS files, JavaScript code, images, etc. At some point, you may want to create something more complex than just static pages. This is where application servers come in to help deliver dynamic content. So we see that web servers are focused on passing requests and application servers are focused on processing them. Data can be taken from files, but more often it's pulled from databases. Then we may want to change it up a bit and not have every little alteration send a request to the server. In that case, we resort to JavaScript or client-side scripts, which allows us to make calculations and checks in the browser without querying the server. For example, it's used when you want to check fields on the client side, you ask to enter a password and its confirmation. Um, to check that the password is correct without going to the server is impossible as it's not sent to the client, but we can check whether the password and its confirmation match. For this, there's no need to go to the server. For this purpose, client scripting in JavaScript is used. The next step is when we may need to create dynamic pages that will use data stored in the server, but without reloading the whole page. One of the mechanisms created for this particular purpose is AJAX. It allows us to send requests to the web server in the background, receive JSON files and XML files in return, process them, and change the structure of the document. To ensure such asynchrony, you will still need to make a request and get a response. If we don't want to deal with continuous background requests and responses, we can replace this with the WebSocket technology in addition to HTTP. That way, we can create even more dynamic interfaces with it. Let's not forget about another important element of any web application still missing from the screen. When working with any system, we need to keep it customer-centric. The key element here is to what extent it's useful and convenient to humans. People use a wide variety of browsers on a wide variety of devices. In essence, they're dealing with different software products, and it's amazing that the same code displays more or less the same way on different platforms. Browsers have a sort of a built-in mechanism that tells them how to interpret the code correctly, depending on the context. This magic mechanism is a set of web programming interfaces, or web APIs. So we've looked at APIs as a way of interacting between programs and from a human's point of view. Now let's reverse the perspective and see how a program views a human being. From the point of view of the program, a simplified model of a person consists of two components, a hand or the ability to click something, and an eye or the ability to perceive visual information. So from the point of view of a machine, a person is a set of controllers that move the cursor around the screen and press the left or right mouse buttons. On the other hand, a person is also a system that a browser or another GUI attempts to address. 
This analogy with humans as interfaces can also be applied to an autonomous vehicle. The images from the sensors, cameras, radars, lidars are the incoming signals, and the commands steer, accelerate, brake are the commands the system produces. But the human model includes one more important component, the ability to perceive data coming through the sensors, for example eyes, and the ability to make decisions about reacting to the information and, let's say, pushing a pedal. When we extrapolate this knowledge and apply it to driverless vehicles, we start thinking about the levels of autonomy driverless cars can have, uh, the decision power they can possess, and the extent to which a driverless car is able to analyze the multimodal context and make decisions based on it. If you're looking into test automation and trying to decide whether to specialize in UIs or Selenium, consider this first. In the future, there will be many more machines and applications than there are people. And the volume of machine-to-machine -machine interaction will surpass the volume of human-to-machine interaction by many orders of magnitude. The smallest of objects, like toothbrushes, toasters, and all kinds of utensils, are on the way to becoming smart objects. When they are parts of a single network, they will be sending messages to each other, thus exemplifying the functional aspect of the Internet of Things. The IoT has been one of the leading trends on the World Quality Report for years now. And even where human-machine interaction will remain prominent, it will not remain at the level of locators and buttons. It will be much more futuristic. You know what I mean if you watched Minority Report. For example, transmitting a hand motion in three dimensions requires a more complex interface than that required to transmit a mouse or a touchpad motion. The same movie contains another example of the human-machine interface via Neuralink. What's important here is that these interactions will be set up via APIs, and obviously not buttons. So, to sum up, learning to work with application programming interfaces is looking to the future. By the way, the movie is also an outstanding example of how preventing errors is better than finding them in testing. Now, let's divert our attention to the relation between a protocol and an application programming interface. A protocol is often compared to a contract, a somewhat lower level concept than an API, but quite similar to it because they both deal with defining the interaction rules. But while an API is the interaction rules themselves, or a format language describing those rules, a protocol is a specific way of communicating messages in that language. So, a protocol transmits information that's encoded for a particular API. The API describes all the valid messages that a single program can accept. It says nothing about the correct order of these messages or their interaction with other programs. Protocols sit on top of the API. A protocol describes the allowable sequence of messages to be passed between different APIs to accomplish a higher level task. For example, TCP IP is a protocol, and there are fixed messages which are an API. Fixed messages have message lists, structures, fields, etc. The fixed protocol sits a level above this API and defines the sequence of messages. For example, first you need a logon message, and then you can send messages like new order single or heartbeats to support the connection. Before we move on to the API types and talk about one of them, 3P, that stands for Private, Partner, and Public, we'd love to share the 3P concept on which the Exact Pro business is based. In our case, the 3Ps stand for Processes, Platforms, and People. We build software to test our client software, always having in mind that the complexity of our platforms has to match the complexity of platforms under test. Our processes have been fine-tuned for years to meet our customers' needs, and our highly skilled people are the only ones that can support these processes and platforms. After all, the best test tool is the human brain. So, processes, platforms, and people are the three closely interconnected pillars of the ExactPro service and the foundation of our corporate culture. The same three pillars are used in the zero-outage industry standard and are the building blocks of successful high-availability development and testing. Getting back to APIs, the three Ps here stand for private, partner, and public. In the slides, you will find a link to a website reviewing the API hierarchy. There are interfaces that, only, that are only used internally, and that's the first P, private. 
There are interfaces used between partners, and that's the second P. And there are public interfaces that can be used by external developers, and which is what the third P stands for. The next typology we'll discuss is LCD, library, code, and data. There are several ways to implement access when it comes to different APIs. Uh, often in financial services and other sectors, the owner of the interface requires the use of a library, which you need to install and link to. Here's an example of this approach at NASDAQ. The link describes how one can interact with the exchange via the Genium Omnet API. It's somewhat similar to implanting a chip into one's body. Some can say that this way brings fewer security issues, but there sure may arise more compatibility issues. The opposite approach is when you use a network protocol and describe the data format. You don't need to link to the exchange, you have no development language limitations, but at the same time, more flexibility means that there's always a possibility of implementing something wrong, since you're expected to write your own code that generates, sends, and receives messages. An example of this approach is the standard called FIX protocol, which is used by most exchanges and brokers in around the world. You can visit the FIX trading community website if you want to learn more about this protocol, and feel free to visit the FIX protocol specifications page at nasdaq.com, explaining the particulars of interacting with the stock exchange via FIX. Between the two extremes, there's a third approach, where the author of the API provides a source code describing how to work with it. This is a great choice. There's no need to write the implementation yourself, and since the code is available, you can always go in and understand how it works, and most importantly, why it doesn't work. A good example of this approach is cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Can you guess the type of Python-based API used in the LGSVL simulator? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and we will come back to this question a little later. In the meantime, getting back to finance, we'll discuss a work group we created and called MOST. It functions within the fixed trading community. MOST stands for Monitoring, Onboarding, and Software Testing. We'll look at each aspect separately. Monitoring and analyzing messages transmitted from one system to another is an important part of any system. Whenever you use an API, you have to think about how you're going to monitor it. What's onboarding? It's connecting and certifying new clients. If your clients are using your API, you need a way to make sure they're not doing anything to harm themselves, you or other parties. The complexity and criticality of this process depends on the type of system and the type of API. And finally, there's the testing of the programming interfaces, which is the question we'll discuss in the next lecture. One of the links I shared at the beginning of this lecture contains an excellent directory of API examples. You can see some APIs you should not look into if you're underage. There are some for the creative community. And for those feeling particularly courageous, here's an example of API for the R3 Corda Enterprise blockchain. The usability of any programming interface, including the API usability, is crucial. That's why there's a discussion around documenting the API, or in other words, having well-described specifications about using it. There's an interesting quote by Joshua Block. Joshua Block is formerly a Java engineer at Google and Sun Microsystems and author of a number of Java programming books. He says that APIs should be intuitive when it comes to correct usage. At the same time, it should be impossible or at least difficult to do something wrong with them. In addition, he also makes an observation that APIs should be self-documenting. That is, we shouldn't need any external resources that would additionally explain how to read or write code around the API. For more information on API specifications, you can always check out the Wikipedia page. The documentation can be designed for humans or machines in the form of machine-readable specs. As already discussed, there will be less and less of the former and more and more of the latter. Here's an example of a human-readable spec that can be found on the website of probably any stock exchange. As for machine-readable specs, I recommend that everyone interested takes a look at the Fix Orchestra project. On the slide, you will find links to both the project and one of our Extend Conference speakers, John Greenan, CEO of Alignment Systems, unveiling the essence of the project. Another issue we need to touch upon in our lecture is interface stability. When something changes in an interface we know, it may invoke a whole range of emotions. For example, we may be happy if something has been improved or upset if a feature has gotten less user-friendly. Unlike us, machines need stability. So API stability is a very important topic. 
it's not going to be separately covered in this course, so those interested can follow the link and learn more about it. Sometimes we want our system to support multiple API versions or different APIs for different users. This is achieved by using a plugin system. A plugin, also called an add-on or an extension, is a piece of software that adds new features to the host program without altering it. Plugins are widely used in digital audio, video, and web browsing and allow programmers to improve the main uh, program while keeping the user within the program's environment. Now, as promised, we'll zoom into the APIs that our seminars will focus on soon. So, where does one get more information on APIs that the LGS VL Simulator works with? The answers can be found in the article entitled The LGS VL Simulator, a High Fidelity Simulator for Autonomous Driving. You may have already come across it uh, while preparing for the lectures and the seminars. You can look into it for your own reference, or if you're going to do any research using the simulator and or getting ready to submit a paper to the IEEE Autonomous Vehicle AI Test Challenge, you can read this article and make references to it if needed. Just a friendly reminder, if you are planning on participating in the IEEE AI Test Challenge, don't miss the important dates. Register your teams of up to six members until March 15th. You'll have to take part in training sessions and submit deliverable one until April 30th at the latest. If you are selected after this point, you'll be expected to submit deliverable two as well as your paper by July 15th and deliver a presentation at the AI test conference on August 23rd. Now let's get back to our article. You see familiar screenshots and a list of authors to write to if you have questions. As we go through the article, we'll come across this picture. Um, there are several APIs in this diagram. The first one is obviously the Python API, which is the programming interface we plan to take apart in the next workshop session and use to create test scripts. Moving on, the bridge links, the simulator and the autonomous car stack. Through this interface, the simulator transmits information from ra radars, lidars, and cameras, and receives commands for the ego vehicle, such as steering, braking, etc. The simulator contains bridges for connecting different kinds of driverless vehicles using the standard ROS, Robot Operating Systems Architecture, or the Apollo specific CyberRT, a C based interface that can be wrapped in Python if needed. But that's not all. Look at the plugins box. This is another API for the Unity graphics engine in C Sharp. This API allows you to add new sensors, new vehicle dynamics, and NPC control, control methods. Please let us know in the comments below what you think NPC mean, means. Just a hint, there's a high chance that your PC will perform well with this simulator if you know exactly what NPC is, because there has been noticed a di direct correlation between the processing power of one's computer and their knowledge of gaming terms. Let's get back to the Python API. LG's documentation has an extensive section describing the available methods which we are going to work with. Please save this link next to the other LGS VL links we previously shared for further reference during the course. The simulator and the API communicate by sending JSON files through a WebSocket server running on port 8181. If you watch one or more of the videos by following the links I mentioned before, you can learn what WebSocket and JSON are. When it comes to classifying LCDs, the LG Python API falls into the public domain source code category. So it's transparent and it's possible to look into any aspect of what's going on. Let's take a look at the first script from Quick Start. If you want, you can turn on Wireshark and intercept the messages when Python API functions are called. So what you're seeing on your screens is a series of screenshots. First, we open a connection to the 8181 port and say that we want to use WebSocket. On the slide, we see that the simulator agrees. We send a JSON file requesting the version. And here comes the response. The last topic I'd like to cover in this video is callbacks. You might get the impression that all APIs work in a query response mode, but that's not true. Very often, the system can send several responses. For example, you send an order to buy 100 stocks. The answer may come at once if your order is aggressively priced, or it may arrive gradually while your order waits and people steadily sell your stocks until the order is fulfilled. It's the same with the Python API of the LG simulator. 
it responds to your requests, but it can also trigger a callback if something like a collision happens. And this we wrap up for today. Thank you very much for enduring this lecture. Please make sure that all the questions you have are heard at the Q&A session. Also, we've made this playlist available for everyone, so feel free to like, comment, and share this video with your friends. You can also subscribe to our channel and keep up with our fresh content that goes beyond the limits of this course. Thank you very much and have a great day.